Father, as we prepare to share the word, Lord, I don't want to stand behind this holy desk before your holy blood what blood bought people in in my own strength. So Holy Spirit, we ask I ask for your help, your empowering, your leading, your directing. Father, speak a word that would make a difference, a word that would bring change and transformation. Father, cause every heart now to come under the authority, the arrestation of the Holy Spirit. Cause every mind now to be focused, to hear and to receive from you. Satan, remind you, the blood of Jesus is against you. Every distraction, cynicism, skepticism that you would present now, we pray against it now in Jesus' name. Speak boldly, Holy Spirit, and clearly in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in a season... Um, where we commemorate the most significant moment in history, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and as you have noticed, it's a season. It's not just a day. And, 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 and it's important because Jesus' resurrection is not fiction. It's not fabricated. We believe that he really did get up. And the resurrection of Jesus is a powerful picture of what is possible. Jesus' resurrection is a challenge to our faith that we should believe in God's ability to bring life to dead things. If the grave could not hold Jesus, our graves will not hold us. Whatever is holding you, whatever is sucking the life out of you, whatever is holding your hopes hostage has to bow its knees, has to release its grip, whatever has you feeling limited has to relinquish its authority when it's met with the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. Jesus got up to show us that we too can get up. And in this season of resurrection, I have been attempting to challenge us not only to appreciate the resurrection, but also to be educated by the resurrection, to learn from the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus shows us that our setbacks can be setups for come-ups. In other words, because here's the thing, you know, we love to say it's a setup for a comeback. Jesus did not come back. He came up. He, he didn't just come back. He came up. And, and he was beaten and he was battered and he was blooded and he was buried. Yet he came out of that grave healed. He came out of that grave whole, empowered and endowed with all authority in heaven and on earth in his hands. He came out better than he went in. You see, see, normally, normally when you go in a grave, you, you don't come out better. You, you, you come out worse. When you go in a grave, you lose skin. When you, when you go in a grave, you come out worse than you went in. But Jesus decided that he was not going to let the grave impact him like it has impacted everybody else. I'm saying in this resurrection season, are you going to let your grave impact you differently? Here's what I'm saying. You may be in a grave, but, 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 but financial debt may have brought somebody to a point of deep depression. But you can choose to go through your grave experience differently because of what Jesus did. Are you, am I making sense? Everybody else went in a grave and stayed in. And Jesus said, I'm not everybody else. And I'm trying to challenge us to look at the tombs in our life because sometimes life, there, there are times in life that feels like a tomb. If you've been through divorce, it could feel like a tomb experience. If you have heartbreak, it could feel like a tomb experience. Debt, uh, despair, failure, sometimes parenting can feel like a grave experience. But I want you to look at the tombs in your life and declare that though everybody else went in and came out worse, I am choosing to come out better. As a matter of fact, I don't just want you to come out of your grave. I am, I'm telling you to, it's time to come out of your grave because the setbacks that you are experiencing does not have to set you back. Two weeks ago, we talked on divine reset to the exodus. Last week, we talked on divine reset to the surgery. And this week, I want to merge both sessions and conclude what we began then. So we are going to talk about divine reset principles for the exodus and the surgery. Principles for the exodus and the surgery. Because we got excited that we're coming out. 
And we understood the need for the surgery. We understood that our, our sight needs to be restored and our hearing needs to be repaired and our speech needs to be rectified. But, 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 but how, 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 what's the process of all of that happening? And so we're going to cover some principles for a successful exodus and a successful surgery experience. Principles for the exodus and the surgery. And so when we think of surgery, it implies a medical practice that treats injuries, diseases, or deformities. And sometimes it involves the physical removal or the repair or the adjustment of organs and tissues. And surgery often implies a, a cutting into the body. Surgery is done by a specialist in a particular field of medicine. Are you following me? In this season of divine reset, God is the specialist doing spiritual surgery, treating the hurts, the pain, the brokenness, the dysfunction in our lives. God is working on the heart to remove selfishness and bitterness and unforgiveness and lack of purpose and aimless living. He's making adjustments to our thinking and he is doing something especially to our being. I, I don't know about you, but God is trying to change the very essence of our being. Principles for a successful surgery and exodus. Point number one, pursue mind renewal. How do I do this, Pastor? Because, because, because for some of us, it's not going to be, uh, the miracle is going to be like a process. And I, I don't want you to get discouraged. And so, so, so the first uh, 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 principle is pursue mind renewal. This is so important. We can preach this for three weeks. Pursue mind renewal. Romans chapter 12. Pursue mind renewal. And verse 2 says this. Don't copy the, the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. God, we, most of us want to be a different person. Most of us want to be a new person. How does God get us to be new people? By changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and perfect and pleasing. Some folks want to think the same way and know God's will. Paul is saying that Christians ought to be more than morally modified people. Christians ought to live their lives entirely altered. If you are a Christian and you are not letting God change you, that's a problem. Christians are not supposed to be morally modified people. Christians are supposed to be people who are completely altered. When people look at you, you should be completely changed. Your speech has changed. Even the way you, everything about you changes when you become a Christian. Apart from salvation, key to living a fully transformed life is the renewing of your mind. A good heart makes you a good person, but a good mind will result in a good life. The, the difference between righteous identity and righteous living is the renewing of the mind. Don't miss that. The difference between righteous identity and righteous living is the renewing of the mind. That's why Paul says... Then you will know, or you will learn to know God's will for you. By the way, those of you who are anxious to know, God, what do you want me to do? Tell me now and I'll do it. Then you will learn. That implies process. Don't stress yourself out. Don't even stress out the pastor. You're just trying to figure. No. Then you will learn the process of God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. It's one thing to know the revealed will of God for your life. It's another thing to live it. It's one thing to say, what am I saying? It's one thing to say, I am more than a conqueror. It's another thing to live like a conqueror. It's one thing to say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It's another thing to live that way. But when the mind is renewed, you can live what you say you believe. Mind renewal, listen, listen, listen to me carefully, because, because I, I, I understand in a great way my congregation, because even when I say mind re renewal and I talk about changing the way you think, I have a feeling somebody's still saying, how? 
I'm doing the best I can to help you overthink, um, um, plenty thinkers. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find the most, um, so, so mind renewal requires that you be alert, that you be attentive. And for, and, and for the younger, the younger folk, I've been reading the urban dictionary, the good parts of it. So how do you get your mind re renewed? Stay woke. Thank you. I worked really hard on that one. I had to look at what does the word woke mean, and I figured, well, how can I use it? But, but, but the point is this. Apparently, it means, I guess, being alert and attentive. Gabby nods, so that means I'm saying the right thing. But, 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 but the point is, if you're going to have a renewed mind, you must be alert and attentive to what is going into your mind. Your mind, uh, we don't have time to look at it. Matthew talks about this. Your mind is like a field. Okay, the farmer and the field and the seeds. And so imagine, and, and, and sometimes this is so important. I mean, there are so many things going after our minds, social media. I'm not, listen, there, there are great benefits to it. But, but not everything, listen, you must be careful how much social media you take in. You must be careful how much television. You must be careful how many people you, you how many conversations you listen to. Because the mind is like a field. The thoughts that are sown in your minds are like seeds. And the outcome that we see in our lives reflect the seeds that have been planted in our minds. In other words, if you do not like what you are seeing in your life, change what is being put into your mind. Because what is being planted in your mind is responsible for the fruit you see in your life. That's why you want your children to be smart. You want put different things in there. Put as a matter of fact, listen, sometimes today we have put something in their mind. Because there's a whole lot of nothing sometimes, but we'll just stick to the notes. Not just the children, a whole lot of nothing. Listen, you can be eat. Uh, we have to. You can eat all day and not receive proper nutrition. Monitor what goes into your mind. Refuse to let negative, cynical, discouraging, and depressing information into your mind. For those of you, I, I, I struggled with this, but for those of you who like the crime shows and the gory stuff, listen, you may think it's fun and good, but, but there are things that you are putting into your mind. It affects how you view life. You wonder why the next time the light goes out and you're in the dark. Or you're walking down the street and it's dark and another and you see something and you'd be amazed how some of the things we put into our mind feeds the fear. The, the fears that we face. Now, now let me be clear. I'm not saying to be arrogant or stuck up. You know, somebody starts saying something negative. Listen, I don't want to hear this, okay? I'm protecting my mind. That is not what I'm saying. That's just rude. I'm saying choose to be a steward of your mind. Whatever has your mind has you young people whoever you need to tell your deepest feelings your thoughts and passions to has you so stay woke and refuse to let satan plant weeds in your mind that will choke out the wheat that god wants to see in your life what am i saying train your brain to think about what you are thinking about and i have the most wonderful church who thinks you just got to train your brain to think about what you are thinking about. You don't just get peace from what you pray about. Peace comes based on what you think about. You know, you, know, you can pray right and think wrong. I'm just trying to help us Christians. May the peace of God that passes all understanding. You know, we know all the scriptures. And once you have quoted the scripture in prayer, then you go thinking, but I'll never get all those bills. Look at the scripture, Philippians chapter 4. Don't worry about anything. I mean, isn't that amazing? Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. I think most of us are good there. Then you will experience God's peace, hmm. which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. Notice verse 8. And now, dear brothers, after you've prayed and given thanks... Fix, uh, brothers and sisters, the Bible equal opportunities. One final thing. 
As a matter, as a matter of fact, what he meant to say was one very important thing. Fix your what? Thoughts. On what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely. You notice how he was stressing the point? You're going to get peace, but fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep, notice it continues verse 9. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Hopefully you get this listen the bible supports the fact that you are able to choose what you think about don't say i can't control it pastor no you are able to but it must be intentional listen as long as you have the holy spirit you don't have to let the day tell you what kind of day it's going to be you wake up in the morning you look in that mirror and you can declare this is the day that my god has made I will rejoice. I will be glad in it. It's going to be a good day because I'm a victor, not a victim. It's going to be a good day because though there are things I cannot control, I will control, well, I, I can't control rather what happens to me. In other words, I can handle what happens to me. We've got dominion. Listen, if you're celebrating Easter, some folks are like, what's with the Easter celebration still? Because we've got dominion, we've got the power, and we are celebrating that. We are taking time to let our spirits know we got the power. What the first Adam messed up, the second Adam got right and restored to us full dominion. So that's why David was able to say, I command my soul to praise the Lord. We, we, we don't praise God because of our feelings. We praise God based on his faithfulness. Don't let the pandemic. Listen, listen, don't deny the reality. But don't, 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 don't let the pandemic cause you to not appreciate the goodness of God. Don't let the pandemic hinder your praise. Sometimes you got you to get old school and say, when I think, you notice, when I think, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me my soul cries out hallelujah thank god for saving me i i gotta preach <laughs> but but you get what i'm saying this is a we are under a new covenant and under this new covenant god supplies us with all that he requires of us I, 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 I got to rush. I mean, I got so much I want to preach, but uh, let's get to point number two. Let, let's get through this. Let's get to number two. Pray and praise consistently. Pray and praise consistently. Pursue mind renewal. I, I just want to help you. Pastor, how do I get through the Exodus? Well, I'm, I'm trying to help you. Pray and, and picture me as Moses I'm about to tell you tomorrow we're coming out and this is what you got to do. Pray and praise consistently. Listen to the statement. Listen to the statement. This, is, this has hurt a lot of us. It has hurt me and it has helped me understanding this truth. In order for us to have breakthrough in the areas we do see, we need breakthroughs in the areas we cannot see. Hello. If you want to have a breakthrough in your finances, you, get a, you need to have a breakthrough in an area that you don't see. Because oftentimes it's the areas that you don't see that's causing you to be stuck in financial ruin. So, so because what am I saying? A real breakthrough is not when God stops the cycle. Real breakthrough is when God shows you what has been starting the cycle in the first place. In other words, real breakthrough is what's been keeping you from sustaining the change. And some of you get frustrated. We just want God to change the person. God's like, I don't just want to, ch I, I, I want to stop. I, I want this thing to end. You want relief. I want complete deliverance. In the Bible, Joshua was the successor of Moses. And Moses was appointed by God, as you know, to lead God's people out of Egypt. And, and they were in bondage. The children of Israel were in bondage for how many years? 400 years. And then eventually, though, after 400 years, they had an exodus. Listen, your exodus is coming. 
I don't care how long you've been there. There is an exodus guaranteed to you. Our God is still the God of the exodus. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the narrative of the Red Sea in the Bible is to show you and me that at times we will face impossible situations, but the same God who parted the Red Sea and made a way for Israel will make a way for you. In order for them, though, to take a hold of the promised land, they had to overthrow what was occupying the land. And they were in bondage for 400 years. So they did not see themselves as soldiers. Instead, they saw themselves as slaves. So they were out of Egypt, but Egypt was not out of them. Listen, if you've been in a particular situation, you, you, you will see yourself as the situation you've been in. And so, 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 so here's what happens with prayer and praise. Prayer and praise does a work in areas that you don't even know that is doing a work. Prayer and praise helps you get free in areas that you didn't even realize you were bound in. And so, so when you practice prayer and praise, it prepares you for the fight that is waiting on you. Because wherever God is taking you, there is a fight. Listen, to every blessing, every blessing, there is a negative side. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You, 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 the Lord gives you promotion. Now you have the problem of time management. <laughs> The Lord gives you more money, now you got the problem of stress, losing the money, and all kinds of stuff. To every blessing, I think one person called it a backside. You get what I'm saying? Okay, and, and, and this is something that we need to get. As Christians, we just, you know, we glory to glory. That's true. But, but God wants to fully prepare us. And so, so God says, I got a promised land for you. But here is the thing. There is a fight waiting for you in the promised land. So I want to prepare you so that you don't sabotage your success. That's what the surgery is all about. That's what this teaching on the Exodus is all about. God is saying, I don't want you to sabotage where I'm taking you. And so God parks them in the wilderness for 40 years so he can get Egypt out of them. In other words, so they can learn to see themselves right. So when we are consistently praying and we're praising, it helps you to see yourself right so you'll fight right. When you spend, a time, when you spend time in prayer and praise, not only will you fight right, but you fight the right kind of fights. Consistent prayer and praise will teach you that you are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. You are not where you came from. You are not your mistakes. You are not your past. That's why it's important when you spend time in prayer, God begins to give downloads and impartation into you. Consistent prayer and praise will help you see yourself the way God sees you. And sadly, listen carefully, because I mean, I, I, trust me, I love some of my folks and some, I, some of my folks love to pray and prayer is important. But some of some people get stuck in a cycle of prayer. Some people get stuck in a cycle of praise because they pray and they praise with no surrender. You pray and you pray. I mean, you, you're not short on the praying. Oh my word. Six o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. I mean, almost every hour. Like there are some people like, they, I mean, that's their day. Okay. But they're far from surrender. I, ju I just wanted to give them a bit of a balance. And so, 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 so the children of Israel were parked in the wilderness and they were stuck. But there were two guys, Joshua and Caleb. Th these are two guys who said, we, we love our calling more than we love the company that we're with. They said, we're going to pay the price for total surrender. Joshua and Caleb understood that if, if they were to settle for, for less than the right type of relationships, they would be taking a corrupted relationship into their future, meaning they will be hurting their future. Listen, young people, what kind of, what, what kind of settling and compromising are you doing now? And here's what happens. You're just hurting your future. There are some relationships that may have worked for you in the past. There are some relationships that may be good for you even where you are now, but there are some relationships that will not fit based on where God is taking you. Can I tell you something? How far you go in life is connected to who you are willing to leave behind. I just want wisdom to write that down. How, <laughs> how far you go in life is connected to who you are willing to leave behind. Some of us, oh, we can't leave anybody behind. Okay. Listen, if there are people who won't leave people behind, you leave them behind. Be careful who you are connected to, who they're connected to, if you get what I'm saying. You see, because not everybody in our lives want to grow. And if some people will not grow, then they can't go where God is calling you to go. God told the children of Israel, remember the story, they will conquer the country uh, uh, one city at a time. 
I really want us to get this. We just want the whole country. We want the whole thing. The whole thing is ours. It's just that God says they'll conquer it one city at a time. Remember the point, pray and praise consistently? Here's what happens. The first city to conquer was what? Jericho. Jericho was surrounded by a wall that would protect that wall from invasion by the enemies. And, and, and theologians tell us that, and, and historians say that the wall was so thick that you could ride a chariot on top of the wall. It was so thick that no weapons could penetrate that wall. That's why the illustration in scripture says, no weapon from the against you shall prosper because your shield, your buckler, and your defense is thick enough that nothing can penetrate. And so the city was so walled up that nobody was getting in and nobody was getting out, but it was still theirs. I'm just trying to speak to somebody. What you're looking at seems so impossible. Nothing is coming or going, but it's yours. Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. <laughs> I'm not even going to preach this. Because the, why was it barred? I mean, I mean they just knew that, that, that the owners are coming. You're having a hard time with your kids. You're having a hard time with your money. You're having a hard time at work because the enemy knows the rightful owner is coming. He's trying to keep you out of what is yours. No one went out and no one came in. They were under lockdown. <laughs> then the Lord said to Joshua, see, remember what I told you last week? Sight restored. Amen. I'm telling you, we, we are holding it. We are a godly church. You know, we preach Bible. I mean, see, if your sight is not restored, you won't see that I have delivered. He said, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Uh, I see a wall along with its king and his fighting men. I <laughs> see that the city has been delivered. First of all, how could I see me having power over the king and all the men? I see a wall. I don't have the power. I don't have the tools. I don't have the capabilities to penetrate that wall. But remember what I told you last week, praying prophetically. Because the term see I have delivered, prophetic, perfect tense. It is describing a future action that suggests it's already happened. God was saying to Joshua, Joshua, it's already done. It's yours. Joshua, I've already determined the outcome. God was saying to Joshua, your life, Joshua, is like a movie. The script is written. I will tell you the end before you get to the middle. Guess what? You win. The fight is fixed and the city is yours. You know, God is turning Joshua into a visionary. You see, see, let me tell you something about visionaries. Visionaries see through walls. I, again, we're not even going to touch this. But, but mm, okay, you know what? Let, let's just keep going. We'll, we'll talk about this some other time. Joshua chapter 6, verse 3. March around the city once with all the armed men. Now, now pay attention to this. We, we're just trying to pray and praise. I, I'm getting there. Listen, armed men, do this for six days. Armed men is a metaphor for intercessors. People who pray. Do you remember when we came into this building? It's just a good place to tell you we didn't happen on this place. Do some people remember? Remember Sister Halcyon and a bunch of folks, Dawkins and all these guys? Remember we, we marked, nobody remembers that? We walked around. We didn't just happen to come here. We walked around it. And, and so armed men... It implies intercessors, praying people. Prayer is essential in the Exodus. But here's what I want to say to you folks, especially those of us that are Pentecostals. You must work and you must pray. Working only is equivalent to pushing the wall on your own. By the way, this is a good place to say you work and you tithe. You work and you set aside a day for worship. You get what I'm saying? You, you, you work, you, you have your day, but you spend time with God. Because working is equivalent to, to, to you pushing the wall on your own. And that's how some of us are living life. We're putting our whole, I mean, we might give God a little bit, but we're putting our whole energies into pushing that wall. Help me, Jesus, whilst you're pushing. Instead of letting him give you strategy. But, when, when you, but here's what happens when you pray and you work. When you pray, imagine that's a picture of God pushing on the top. And when you act on your prayers, that's you pushing at the bottom. If you've got both of these things working, that thing must move. Joshua chapter 6, verse, are you following me so far? 
Okay, Joshua chapter 6, I ask you every so often, are you listening? I say words like, listen, are you there? Because I understand to a certain extent how the brain functions. After 10, 15 minutes, you begin to think about the ox still cooking. Or those of you that are home, I mean, you're just thinking about, oh Lord, like, I don't know what's in the oven or something. Or I got to plant my garden if you're Sister Lindsay, whatever. You get what I'm saying? So I'm saying words to kind of bring your mind back to focus this house. And he's thinking, does Rick have the lamb ready? Did he forget to take it out of the oven? <laughs> but... <laughs> But here's what he says, march around the city, <laughs> what is this here, Josh, Joshua chapter 6, march around the city once with all the armed men and do this for six days. Now notice prayer, remember I said pray consistently, praise consistently, he says have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. Armed men, prayer, ram's horn, praise. I'm not going to pick on my worship team today because while this says priests, they need to take their response. This is no simple responsibility to stand before God's people and lead them in worship. It's not a simple, it's not a simple thing, but we'll come back to that some other time. But notice the ram's horn implies praise. But here's what I want you to get. The ram's horn was in front of the ark. The ark represents the presence of God. They were carrying the presence of God. The praise team was in front of the ark. Am I making sense? When praise comes, the ark follows. In other words, when praise comes, his presence, wherever there is praise, there is his presence. So imagine what happens if you are praying and you are praising, you for sure have the ears of God and the presence of God working with you. Oh, Jesus. So they walked around the city. Once per day for six days. And on the seventh day, they were to march around seven times. Now, now this was not some military strategy. This was ceremonial. This was about, listen carefully, this was about right positioning. I'm, I'm trying to, to stress the point that sometimes prayer and praising is hard work. It's not easy. And there's a little bit of a military tendency. It's ceremonial. So, so develop the practice. The habit of praying and praising. Why is that important? Because whilst you're doing that, you may not see it, but God is positioning you. Because there are some blessings you get because you circled around long enough. You stayed in prayer long enough. You praised even on a hard day. You praised even when you didn't feel like it. Some walls fall down when you stay consistent in prayer and praise. Because if you stop praying and praising, you mess up the surgery. If you stop praying and praising, oh, if you, mm, if you stop praying and praising, you mess up the healing. If you stop praying and praising, you miss the exit door. So pray and praise will keep you in the right place. With the right attitude, the right mindset for as long as you need to be there. Because as they stayed in prayer and praise, the Bible says the walls came down and they went in. Because those walls are going to come. Down. I don't know what your walls are, but here's what I'm saying. You let your mind be renewed. You stay in prayer. You stay in praise. Those walls are coming down and you just want to be rightly positioned. So when they come down, you can step in. problem for some of us is we get shifted by life and people and we get distracted and then you see the walls come down and you're running to catch up you, you might get in but you won't get what's yours oh my god you might get in but you won't get what's yours because somebody else might take what's yours stay in a place of prayer in a place of prayer and a place of praise i, I trust me it's not easy but you got to do it let me let me give you number three real quick we got we got to get through these are we still together all right um, 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 number three, relinquish expectations and interpretation. I, I mean, I, I mean, it's interesting because I blame the congregation for being overthinkers. And when the pastor looks at the messages and the points, he's beginning to think, oh, well, that was, a, that was deep. I mean, we could preach a whole sermon to that. So maybe the overthinking is probably coming from the head. <laughs> because, because, I mean, we, we, this, this one is so deep. Relinquish expectations and interpretations. Listen, listen, all I'm going to say to you on this is what, what Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says. Okay, let, let me give you a minute to write it. Relinquish expectations and interpretation. We all have that, you know. 
We all have expectations and interpretations. And if you had daddy issues and mommy issues, God Almighty. Because you expect God to do for you things that it's not up to him to do. But, but here, here, is, here is why it's important to relinquish expectations and interpretation. Because the scripture says, Romans chapter 8 verse 28. This is how the living Bible puts it. And we know that all that happens to us is working for our good. Divorce. All that happens to us, bankruptcy. All that happens to us is working for our good. Cancer. All that happens to us is working for our good. Financial debt. All that happens to us, people are talking about me. All that happens to us is working for our good if we love God and are fitting into his plans. Listen, it'll work for your good, but you better love God and make sure your plans are God's plans for you. Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. I'm trying to show us that we all have expectations about the way God will work. We all have expectations about, about the, 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 the means he will use and what it will look like where he's taking us. We have our own interpretations about what God has said. And oftentimes we interpret based on the leanings of our deceitful heart. We interpret what God says based on our own selfishness. We interpret what God says based on our own selfish desires. Listen carefully. Interpretation is not communication. When God speaks, let him translate what he means. He'll do it. But we're just too busy to help him out. So we don't stay long enough in a season of prayer. Because if you fail to relinquish your expectations and your interpretations, it will lead to frustration and discouragement. Let's keep moving. We'll probably talk about this in the future. Number four, embrace and celebrate small changes. Embrace and celebrate small changes. When you're trying to make changes in your life, you need a group of people. For example, if your plan was, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to have a whole day where I, never, I don't lie at all. Listen, confess that to somebody and say to somebody, you need to hold me accountable. And if you have a whole day where you don't lie, Man, you call that pre- I, mi- I did not lie today. And guess what? Make them send you a sweetie, whatever it is. Yep. Chocolate. Listen, celebrate small changes. Embrace small changes. This is important because we're looking for drastic changes. Ezekiel chapter, uh, Zechariah chapter 4. Do not despise small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Don't despise a small change. Don't think God is not pleased because, oh, I said I was not going to lie for the whole day, but I only did not lie for half a day. The Lord rejoices in small beginnings. You remember in Ezekiel's case, the bones became an army, but the change was gradual. What is important is to be intentional. Be careful that you don't work hard at the wrong thing. Here, here's why this is important to embrace and celebrate small changes. When you focus on embracing and celebrating the small change, God can refine you properly. You, you don't want to lie for a whole day. Somebody says, well, you didn't do half day. What caused you to lie in the last part of the day? What caused you to lie for the latter half of the day? God is refining you, helping you figure it. Why is that important? Because, because there may be skills that God wants you to acquire for where he's taking you. When you take time to celebrate and embrace the small changes, he prepares you. You know, that, that, listen carefully. You may come to a point in your life where God will allow your natural gifting to hit a ceiling. Why? It's not because you're done for. It's because God is forcing you to require or to accept that you need some new skills. You ever been there? It's like everything you did. There was a time everything you did was right and you were amazing. And all of a sudden, everything you do is wrong. You can never please the boss. You're like, that's God. Saying, I, I want you to acquire some new skills. Mm, like I said, we've got too much to talk about. Let me give you number five. I'm going to wrap this up. Be quick to remove and refocus. And I'm hoping that, you know, I told you guys when I leave this earth, I plan to leave empty. I'm hoping you people get the exodus. I'm hoping we get the exodus that we need. Be quick to remove and refocus. Okay. 
Proverbs chapter 4, 20, uh, be quick to remove and refocus. This is important because why do I connect them? Because sometimes when you remove something, it's hard to refocus. You know, you spend so much time, oh Lord, you know, be quick to remove and be quick to refocus when you lose focus. When God says move something out of your life, be quick to get it done. When God says get certain people out of your life, be quick to get them to have them gone. Proverbs chapter 4, 25 to 27. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Look straight ahead. Fix your eyes. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. And Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run the race with endurance. Let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Listen, you won't be able to endure the journey if you don't remove some things from your life. You won't be able to endure the journey if you don't fix your focus, refocus your sight. So be quick to remove everything or anything that keeps you out of God's place for you. Question for you, are you in the place where God wants you to be? I didn't say, do you like the place where you are? <laughs> are you in the place where God wants you to be? Because whatever keeps you out of God's place for you will slow your pace towards where God is taking you. This is biblical. God did not wait. Do you remember when Adam and Eve sinned? God did not wait for them to say, fine, fine, we're leaving. No, no, no. God removed them. Don't remember I said to you, some of you, some of us, God is not doing certain things in our life because we won't remove the bitterness. We won't remove the unforgiveness. We won't remove the people. We am I making sense? Some stuff will not leave until you put it out. Some people you have to put in the right place in your life and some people must be removed. I told you this last week. Not because they're dysfunctional, it's just because they're a distraction. So life happens, but be quick to refocus. Remember Peter, he was walking on water and he began to sink. He didn't sink because he lacked drive and passion. He lost his focus. So beloved, God is doing surgery. He's giving us an exodus. He's doing it in ways that helps us build intimacy and fellowship and dependence on him. And I am trusting that your response to this message is, God, I surrender. I'm trusting that your response to this message is, God, fix me and get me out. I'm trusting that your response to this message is, God, let resurrection power flow through me. I remember years ago hearing this. I, uh, you know, I, 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 as I said, I've told you many times, there are areas in my life where I'm rich and there are areas where I'm poor. And I remember one of my mentors, mentorship is so important. So, and mentors can be mean sometimes. <laughs> I'm having, what is that movie where the guy puts his little finger in his mouth? Like uh, one of the Austin something, yeah. Dr. Evil. But here is, here is what he said to me, and I thought it was so mean, but he said, glass that is broken serves people. Sorry, glass that is not broken serves people. Glass that is broken hurts people. Yeah, it was an ouch moment for me. But I'm telling you that now. As we talk about all of this stuff, you know, I struggle because the timing is gone. But when I look at how hard the world is coming, I'm like, God... Help me to put aside this time issue and be sensitive, yes, but help me be true to teach what you are wanting your people to hear. And I'm saying to us as believers, glass that is not broken serves. Glass that is broken hurt. Are you hurting or serving? So maybe you do not need fixing. Then your prayer should be, God, what do you want, what do you want to put in me? For where you're taking me next you know god is concerned about our exodus yes most of us we are more concerned about our arrival but god is concerned about our coming out in other words he's concerned about our development 
because he wants us to get to the next level equipped and prepared. So do you believe, and there is a tomorrow for you. Do you believe that things will never change for you? Mind renewal. I know you're in church and you're like, it's good for the young people. Do you believe that change can happen for you? Oh, it's good for my children. Do you believe that change can happen for you? No life when given to Christ is beyond redemption. And I don't just mean going to heaven. I'm talking about you can have a rich and satisfying life on this earth. Even if you live for five more days, it can be the richest and most satisfying five days of your life. God's power is not limited. That's what the resurrection story teaches us. You are not too old for a resurrection. Do you remember Sarah in the Bible? This story is not just about the fact that you can get pregnant at an at, at old age. The story is also about the fact that God can birth things in us in seasons that will not happen for other people. What am I saying? I'm saying that there are things that God wants to birth in you, even though it's not the right season. I'm saying that there are things that God wants to do for you and through you that other people might be rightly positioned and, 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 and they're still not producing. I'm saying trust God for yourself based on your situation. You know, I was thinking about it. I, the other day I had to spend, I didn't have to, I chose to spend time with some of the guys at the church. Okay, let me correct that. They invaded my workspace. And what happens is, they don't know that I've noticed. And, and then we brought, well, we brought Malachi as well. And the problem is it's contagious. I, I know the time is gone, but, but what else are we going to do? We're under lockdown, so relax a little bit. You can't go out. No, you see, I'm trying to tell this and I hear my mind. Just, I feel like somebody's saying, hurry up. What was my point now? Old age, I tell you. Yeah, so Malachi comes. And I, I thought there was hope that at least I would have a partner. And I left. No, they were there and they were talking about sports and basketball. And of course, I'm sitting there. I'm just like, what is it, a deer in headlights or whatever the expression is? Because I don't know what they're talking about, who got traded to who and how the Raptors is not going to win for three more years because Powell said he's not coming back or some story and Massad should go, like whatever it was. And then when I thought there was hope for the future that I could have a conversation with somebody, Malachi comes and he literally just runs into the conversation. Yeah, because once they got rid of Powell, it's never going to happen. And I'm like, oh God, like, there's no hope for me now. Like, how does he know that? I have no idea. So then I decided that I should probably take up a sport. <laughs> Listen, you have your issues and I have mine. So yes, I compare myself to want to be hip like the young guys. They're passionate about it. Looked at basketball, mm -mm, too much running, can't do that. There's all this jumping stuff with the knee and all that. Mm -mm. About to have the second knee done surgery on, mm -mm, it's not going to happen. Thought about football, mm -mm, head concussions, absolutely not. Thought about soccer, a whole bunch of running. I got to move to Europe. It's not going to happen. Hockey, well, you know, I used to skate when I lived in Montreal. I mean, once I no longer had a girl to impress, you know, it was over. At the time, I mean, the girl I have to impress now is I have to do different things. I just got to preach cute. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Lord Jesus Christ. So then I fell upon boxing. I thought... Yeah, I could do that because as most of you know, some of my favorite scriptures are the kingdom of God suffered violent and the violent take it by force. I'm like, yep, I can do that. And I began to think about things like Jesus went into the grave like a lamb, but he came out like a lion. Like I just, you know, he's the lion. Of the, all that kind of stuff came into my mind. And I thought, boxing, I can handle. My name is going to be the, 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 the redeemed lion. I know it's a terrible name, you know, but. And I, I have this issue where my brain thinks a lot. Like I said, maybe it's from the head. Uh, yeah, very interesting. And I studied a little bit, Googled, whatever, and I realized, oh, there is something interesting. And there is a point, by the way, to this. But when boxers are fighting, and then I had to endure like a watch on, on, on YouTube, a boxing match, I figured 10 rounds was a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> somebody punching you for like... Yeah, but you get to punch too, so as long as you're good, it was a whole different thing. But here is something that I learned from that experience. 
is that some of us, we need to take lessons from boxers. Because boxers, they fight, and they fight, but they know when to go to the corner. They may not feel like going to the corner, but when coach, I don't know if the boxer is the guy's the coach or whatever it is, but you know the guy who's on there? When he calls them to the corner, they know when to go. And listen, I'm saying to us in this pandemic, consistent lockdown, is God sending a message to the church? I'm calling you into the corner. Some of us fight, and I know I love you, those of you who are connected to this church, but I've watched you. You fight, and you fight, and you fight, but you don't go to the corner. And even if you do go to the corner, you don't go long enough so that the benefits of the corner can affect your living, your fighting. Here's what I'm saying. Do you get the picture of a boxing ring, and the match stops, and then you go in the corner? Here's what happens in the corner. You get refreshed. Here's what's happened in the corner. You get your wounds attended to. You get a checkup. In the corner, the bleeding is stopped. In the corner, the trainer can speak to you and remind you, you can do this. You've got the power. This is not greater than you. In the corner, you're reminded no weapon from the against you shall prosper. In the corner, you're reminded you are the head and not the tail. I will give you power to gain wealth. In the corner, you are reminded you will overcome. As a matter of fact, you are overcoming. Here's what I'm saying. Too. Here's what I'm saying. Let me be just blunt and be pastoral. When we get together, whether it's online or in person, you need to be calling everybody and saying, I didn't see you online today. I didn't see you on Zoom. Because here's what I'm saying, beloved. You know where the corner now is? It's the church. I'm trying to challenge you. Whether we are online People say, I'm too tired. It's been a long day. I'm, listen, we try to be balanced. Listen, you, we, the fight in life is hard. We need to make time to go to that corner. I believe with all my heart that the corner is God's church. I don't mean just a church service. The corner is us as believers. When people encounter us, do they get refreshing? Do they get their wounds attended to? I hear somebody say, but pastor, I get hurt in the church. You know what? I say you were right. But I also say sometimes the very medication that I need to take have terrible side effects. Yet I still go to the doctor. I still take the medication. Why? Because I want to live. Church hurts. Yes, but healing also happens in church. I just wanted to put that point. It was very important because in this time where everything, you know, we're moving into a season where, I don't know, only 10 people are allowed and, and you're going to have so much distractions. But I want to say to you, every day, every week, make it a priority to get into a corner. There are times when you find a corner just you and God. There are times when that corner is going to be you and another brother or another sister. There are times when that corner is going to be the church community coming together. It's important that we learn to do that. Because I don't want us to miss our exodus. We need to get on, the master, on the, the, the master surgeon's operating table. And we need to stay there until he says, you're ready. You can leave. Let's stand. I know we've gone over the time. Forgive me if that offended you. But I believe the Holy Spirit is doing something. The Holy Spirit has spoken to us. Our best response to this message is I surrender. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days let them flow with ceaseless praise. Let them flow with ceaseless praise. Take my hands. Take my hands and let them move at 
the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Swift and beautiful for thee. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be the royal throne. It shall be thy royal Take my love, my 